You're listening to The Virtue Podcast, brought to you by the Great Hearts Institute. Good conversations around the great conversation. Well, welcome back to The Virtue Podcast. I'm Robert Jackson, Executive Director of the Great Hearts Institute, and it is my distinct pleasure today to introduce a genuine polymath, right? You don't find those every day. You don't catch them anywhere in town, but we do have today a storyteller, a musician, a teacher, a scholar, and uh, a number of other things that we'll get to in Dr. Junius Johnson. I want to say before we get started, Junius, you really have brought the love of learning to new heights. Uh, you are pursuing with passion, right, the heart of the fairy story. Mm -hmm. And what Robert Frost used to say of poetry, the delight that leads to wisdom, right? It begins in delight and ends in wisdom. I feel as though this Yale-trained philosopher theologian, thoroughly prolific, is revitalizing really the interdisciplinary nature of classical liberal arts education. And he's doing it by example. Junius is making things beautiful. He's saying those things eloquently and he's presenting it with integrity. And I think more people are gonna pick up on that, Junius. So happy to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Junius, in your writing on education, what you would refer to as your philosophy of education, you really do lay emphasis on wonder, mm -hmm. imagination, and beauty. How did you uncover these essential features? Tell us a little bit about that tale. Yeah, it's funny. It kind of comes from two different parts of my experience. One is just my own experience growing up. Um, I was not... Uh, I never thought of myself as, you know, oh, I want to be a scholar and I'm all into, you know, learning all the things there are to know or whatnot. Um, and and my, in fact, my, my own early schooling, everything was very utilitarian. My, my dad would pay me for my grades. And so I got $5 for every A and $3 for every B. And uh, that was my motivation to get good grades. Um, at a certain point when the money dried up, I discovered that I didn't have any motivation for the schoolwork beyond the, the payoff, the literal payoff at the end of it. And so that was the end of that. But at the same time, I was just ravenous when it came to devouring story and devouring these, these other worlds that had been constructed like Narnia and things like this. I would dig deep into their history and into the different characters and make all these theories about what was going on. Um, <clears throat> what was really happening was I was just following the things that tugged at my heart. I was following my loves and I was following this sense of wonder that started for me the first time Lucy stuck her head in a wardrobe and stepped out into a winter landscape. Um, that was fueled the first time I went to a movie theater and the Fox fanfare played and the Star Wars theme started and the Empire Strikes Back crawl started up the screen. And I knew that magic was possible in the world. And it was just kind of a chasing after that over and over again. You know, where's the next place where I'm going to encounter that sense of something more, something magical that I didn't have in my ordinary life. And that was kind of the scandal of my everyday life was that it wasn't that way. Now, well, this is interesting because you're hinting at what distinguishes your philosophy of education from most modern educationists. I mean, you and myself and others uh, who were publicly educated may have had something much more utilitarian, but maybe you can spell out for us just exactly what distinguishes your philosophy from, from your typical educationist. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think it comes down to... Um, you've got to look at education is not directionless, right? We're educating for something. And um, sometimes in the in, in the history of education in this country, we've lost sight of that. And there's been this notion of, well, education is just a good thing to do. It's good to have knowledge. And so we got to give the kids knowledge, right? But, but what is knowledge really? Is knowledge just facts or is knowledge facts in some sort of context? And if it is, then there's really no ability we have to give someone just knowledge, right? You always got you've got to educate them towards some end, and so then we come and think, well, we want them to be able to have to get good jobs, and so we educate them vocationally, or we want them to be informed voters, and so we educate them with a civic end in mind. <clears throat> the end is always very important to what's going on. For me, if education is going to mean anything, because I take an old view on education, right? I mean, I, I take a view that education is about making better humans. Um, or rather making humans. It's as if we, we start off not really human, not, not fully human, and education is trying to bring us further into that space, then um, that means education has got to address the entire person. Mm -hmm. An education that just addresses my mind is not really aimed at making me more human. 
just to the extent that a detached computer, a, a, a mental calculator in a vat isn't a human being anymore, right? We're embodied. We have not just minds, but hearts. We have feelings. We have hopes and dreams and all these other sorts of things. So all that stuff has to come into the educational process. All that stuff is part of not just how I want to lead students forward, although it is. I want to lead them by their hearts as well as their minds, by both, not one or the other. But it's also what we're trying to educate. We're not just trying to train their minds and their habits of mind. We're trying to train also the heart. We're trying to train that central node where wonder and imagination reside. It's interesting. Uh, one of your essays that, uh, that I was able to peruse speaks of the unfettered imagination. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you point to practices that you believe will help teachers parents and others, right, who influence and shape children to avoid unintentional boundaries or unnecessary boundaries or limitations to, to the child's imagination. Mm. And, and you have this wonderful anecdote from your own daughter's experience. Mm. Maybe you could share with us a little more about what, you, what you're saying here, what's important in trying to leave the imagination unfettered. What, what's the importance there? Yeah, so um, one of the things, I like to take people back to... Um, the first Star Wars movie. Um, and in Star Wars A New Hope, uh, Han Solo is trying to figure out why he should help Luke, why he should bother going to rescue this princess and risk his life in the process. And so Luke is trying to find some way to motivate this guy. And he finally gets this idea and he says, Han, she's rich. And then he starts paying attention. He knew, ah, this is Han's language. And Han says, really? Says, yeah, if you help her, the reward would be and Han's like, what? I need to know how much it's going to be because I've got debts. Job is chasing after me. And Luke says, well, more than you can imagine. To which Han replies, I don't know. I can imagine a lot, right? <laughs> um, classic Han Solo. But, and in fact, because it's classic Han Solo, it's classically wrong, which is typically Han's always just a little bit wrong about everything. Um, he actually can't imagine a lot because he's thinking about very large sums of money. But what he's actually going to find in Princess Leia is something so much more significant and life-changing and important than just money. And I think in many ways, Han's failure in that relationship, the failure to be able to hold his family together going forward in that relationship, comes in part from that same lack of imagination that was there at the beginning. He never really got a, his mind around what was possible. And we tend not to strive after things that we don't think are possible. Once we judge something to be impossible, we shut it down. <clears throat> so you were referencing my daughter's experience. This was this happened this past year at my school. She goes to a classical school and we were going to a parent teacher conference. Uh, and so we, we, we you know, it wasn't, a, nothing was wrong. It was just every parent, parents got to come in and see the teacher and it's, it's a good time to touch base. So we go in and we're looking around the classroom and it's the first time we've seen the classroom since the first day of school. And my wife and I both noticed at the same time, there's this sign on the wall, uh, this teaching them how to color. Um, and it says, use appropriate colors. And it's got all these things, but, you know, so the sun should be yellow, grass should be green, this sort of a thing. And, um, and my wife looks at me and she goes, um, I don't know what I think about that. Um, now, of course, in the classical tradition, mimesis is important and representing the world and learning from the way the world really is, is an important foundation. And that's what the teacher was going for. And there was nothing wrong with that. But my wife and I have our eyes on something else too. We have an incredibly imaginative, incredibly playful little girl. And one of the things that we're committed to as parents is making sure that she grows up in such a way that guards that imagination. Because the very process of growing up, the way we do it these days, is a process of telling children, you've got to stop all that, right? It, it, it's, mm. it's not magical. Mm -hmm. Cats aren't special. They're just other another animal. It's fine. Let's just move on. And you've got to figure out what's actually happening in the world. And you've got to get practical, right? You've got to come right. down to earth. Um, well, I've read, read entirely too much George MacDonald and C.S. Lewis and G.K. Chesterton to, to have much sympathy with the notion that what it means to live life well is to live it down to earth in a practical, boring adult sense. Um, and so, you know, I thought about it and I was like, well, I want to affirm what the school is saying. And so I told her, yes, you know, when you're at school, color with appropriate colors, do what they're asking you to do, understand what our world looks like and how to represent that in on paper. But there's two other things I want you to consider. The first is that our world is kind of wildly wonderful and is not always best represented by simply painting it the way it is. Yeah. 
sometimes in order to reveal deeper dynamics of what's going on in the world, we do need to present it in unusual ways. And I think we see this in impressionistic movements, in painting and music and whatnot, which you know, they, they deceive the eyes, they, they frustrate the eyes mm -hmm. in order to cause us to look deeper and see something else true that we might have missed if we stayed at the surface level. That's one thing. The second thing is, daughter, I want to see the worlds that only exist in your head. Mm. I want to see the world in your head where the sun is purple because purple is your favorite color. And I want to see what that does to everything else. Because this in mental space inside my daughter's head is one of the most important spaces that there is in all of existence to me. And her art is one of the few ways I have of gaining access to that. And I don't know what incredible things she might not teach me and all of humanity from that space in the way that all of our great poets and writers and artists of the past have done. And I want to make sure that that stays open and that doesn't get shut down because she thinks, oh, no, I'm not supposed to write or paint or think that way. Yeah. This is uh, this is powerful. I, I, when you use the word practical, the first association that came to mind was T.S. Eliot's Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. I Here we talk book. about Macavity, for example, the mystery cat, Growl Tiger and others, right? Mephistopheles. Yeah. My goodness, that's the kind of practical I'm into. And it sounds like you and your daughter are as well. That's right. You've written a book on teaching fairy stories, and in it, you actually scope out what fairy stories are and how they work. You mm -hmm. argue that these should be integral, as I think you've just hinted at here. Provide us with a definition of fairy, right, mm -hmm. and explain why that is so important. You're getting there, but just go ahead and elaborate on that if you would. Yeah, uh, I'll start with what Tolkien says about it. Tol Tolkien wrote a wonderful and, and classic essay called On Fairy Stories which is one of the places that everyone has to go when they start to think about. We'll include that in the show stories. notes, Junius. We'll include okay. that one in the show notes. All right. You guys, if you haven't read it yet, I'm excited for you to dig into that for the first time. Be patient with him. He's a scholar, but it's good. Um, he says, fantasy, the making or glimpsing of other worlds. So fantasy, which means the making or glimpsing of other worlds, was the heart of the desire of fairy. So for him, what makes something fairy is it's got this connection to either making other worlds or glimpsing other, which is very interesting because glimpsing other worlds implies that you're not having to make them. They're already there. Yeah. You're just gazing in, right? Mm -hmm. That's that Lucy sticking your head in the wardrobe thing again. Um, that's, that's sort of ground zero for me. So when I talk about fairy stories, I, I start from that. What I mean are fairies that are fantastic, stories that are fantastical in nature. Right, whether that fantasy derives from setting or plot or characters, that's not really the point. Is there some fantastical element mm -hmm. there? Then what that's going to do is it's going to give the entire story this different atmosphere, this different air, and that's what the fairy means to me. So we've all read stories where you're reading along and like the kids are going down the street in their bikes and then they they come to the old abandoned house and they get off their bikes and they go in and everything's dusty and old and whatnot. And you don't know what kind of story you're reading yet. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's possible yet. Right. And it could be that what's, you know, the, the encounter that we're here to see, because we wouldn't be telling the story if there weren't some encounter we were there to see, right? It could be that that's with, you know, a cranky old Mrs. McCready, who's going to just come out and say, you kids get out of my house. And that's sort of the, the end of it. And that's one sort of story. But then, you know, they hear a noise that isn't easily explained. And you begin to think, maybe that's not the kind of story I'm in. And then you, they see something move by itself floating across the room. And you think, okay, whoa, what kind of story am I in? And then they open a door, and on the other side of that door is a completely other world. Yeah. And, yeah. and each of those elements adds something to the atmosphere of the story. And the atmosphere is doing things to your heart as you read it. And yeah. that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the, the power that that otherworldly quality has to bypass a lot of the sophistication, or maybe I should say sophism, that we as adults are brought into and reconnect us with something more childish in us and to allow children to revel in something native to them that is, um, I think, one of the most important things we have to guard in educating children. Well, this is interesting. I'll play the sophisticated adult or sophistic adult here and ask if these imaginative flights of fairy or fancy are so important, 
how will they prepare the students for the real world, right? Yeah. What of the real yeah. world? And that's a really important question. Um, I, Cause I could always do the sort of, you know, humanities thing and say, well, let's not make this all utilitarian and pragmatic. It's inherently intrinsically valuable and we have to leave it at that, right? But, but that's a very hard line to actually get off the ground because when you start describing why something's intrinsically valuable, it's very easy to slip over into making it instrumental again. Well, it's valuable because it makes you a better, okay, so now you're not, it's not valuable in itself. It's valuable for something it can do for me. So yeah. I, I, I'm not going to do that kind of humanities juke to, to dodge your question. I'm going to take it head on. Um, and I'm going to say that um, these types of stories, stories that present the world to us in ways radically differently than how we experience it, and even to some extent radically different to how we can experience it, these stories re reveal important truths about our world. And let me get at it this way. Um, imagine a man who was born upside down. He's lived his entire life upside down. He's, he walks about on his hands with his feet in the air, and he sees the entire world upside down. Um, now, he's going to have very particular beliefs about the nature of the world, about the nature of gravity, right? Gravity is that thing that makes things go up because to him, up is down and down is up. Um, everything's going to be just – everything's going to be seen just differently to how we do. In fact, differently to how it is because gravity does have an orientation towards the center of the earth, and that's the right way things are supposed to go. Um, what if it were not possible to reorient this man correctly? It's, so there's some impediment. This is obviously a fantastical world. He's born upside down. There's yep. some impossibility such that he can't be oriented rightly. Is he stuck? Well, maybe, but there is just one more really radical thing you could try. You could turn the entire world upside down. Hmm. Hmm. And if you manage to do that, then finally for the first time, the man would be seeing rightly. He might not even know it. He's like, whoa, the world is upside down. It's weird, right? Things fall down. That's so crazy. What's going on here? It's like some sort of crazy fairy story. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's what I think fairy stories do for us. They turn the world upside down because we need to have the world turned upside down because we're looking at it from the wrong way up. And so in doing, they're actually reinterpreting the world to us in ways that are vital. It's not about facts. Fairy stories aren't about facts. They're about meaning. And meaning is so much more, I'll dare to say, useful than facts. This is fascinating. You probably are familiar with the anecdote where the great Albert Einstein, having achieved uh, acclaim as a, as a world-class physicist, is approached by the mother of a young child and asked, mm -hmm. so I want my young man to become a future scientist. What do I need to do for him? And Einstein simply says, read him fairy stories. Mm -hmm. And then she said, great, great. And what do I need to do to help him become a world-class <laughs> scientist? To which Einstein responds, read him more fairy stories. And yet a third time, right? And the woman is just perplexed. But I think Einstein, as other great physicists and scientists have, have demonstrated, was capable of seeing the world right side up or mm -hmm. alternatively to the going or the, the leading hypotheses of the day in, in his scientific community. And that ability to kind of step out of the mainstream, so to speak, is rudimentary. I mean, it's fundamental for those who are truly gifted and capable of expressing truths mm. that go beyond the surface, right? And mm. I think that's part of what you're what you're speaking to. In classical education, when we talk about teaching students how to read closely, so a close mm. reading of a passage. In part, this is so that they really do uncover the layers and get beyond just the surface meaning, the basic grammar or syntax. Tell me, because you 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 lay some emphasis on this, how do you attend to the activity of close reading in your classrooms? How might that look different than other classrooms? Mm. Well, one of the things that I'm that I'm interested in is, um, you know, there, there's a couple ways to get into anything. And so a lot of times you know, we're trained according to one particular model, and then we think, okay, that's the way this thing has to be done, and so that's what we do. And so close reading looks like I'm going to read you a line of the poem, and then we're going to go and do we're going to dig into word by word and look at the images and whatnot. And I do that, and that's fine. I love it. It's, it's, that's, that's, that's a great way to do it. But there's another way to do it that is to go to where the student's interest takes them and then ask them to dig in. One of the things that I was always doing with my friends when I was growing up, and I've noticed that there's something, there's a whole subculture of people in our society that we need to pay more attention to in, in the education world. 
and um, and we don't, and we and we really have got to fix that. And that is nerds, because <laughs> nerds, and I'm thinking Star Wars nerds, Lord of the Rings nerds, Marvel nerds, right? All of those guys. What do they do? They go see a movie and they come back and they sit down with their friends and they dissect that thing mm-hmm. into tiny little bits. And they come up with theories. And you'll see these crazy theories come up. What if Jar Jar is actually a Sith Lord? Right. And, you, and, and at first blush, you're like, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And they say, no, no, no. Wait, listen to the evidence. And they start taking you through the movies scene by scene mm. and showing you these things, these little details. That are there. You know what they're doing? Of course you do. They're close reading the movies, right? Now, mm. their theory may or may not stand up to the close reading. And one of the dangers of this way of coming about it is that you tend to get, um, you tend to gain an allegiance to your theory before you've seen whether it will stand up or not. And right. so you have a prejudice that makes you want to cause the reading to stand up. But I mean, I hate to break it to you, but all reading is much more like that than we normally like to think that it is. But for, for, for students, right, their first first reading, their first close reading doesn't have to be perfect close reading. They need to see that close reading is a valuable thing to do so that they will want to do it going forward in the future. So if we're reading something, I'll say, so what stood out to you? You know, what do you, th- what's, what's, what do you think is going on here in the text? And they'll say, well, I really like the way that, let's think about The Hobbit. I really like the way that Smaug talks about, um, you know, how powerful he is. Okay, so what's behind that? Why do you think he would say that? And then get to the point where they think, well, maybe, you know, Smaug has this thing. Okay, great. That's good. Good theory. So now, what do you see in the text that supports that? Take us to a place that, that'll that support that. And what they're learning a couple of things at once. They're learning that their theories can be taken seriously. Um, it's okay to have crazy and cool ideas about the text. But they're also learning we can't stop there. We've got to test those. Mm-hmm. We've got to dig deeper and improve that from the text. And if I can't show it from the text, then I'm going to have to let that go or I'm going to have to spend more time with the text. And do What would be better than for a student to spend the whole class period trying to push some crazy reading that nobody's buying, including the teacher, and the student goes home and says, I'll show them. I'm going to do I'm going to write a 15-page paper proving that this is the way this book should be read. I don't have to sign the paper anymore. You're doing it yourself now, right? I mean, that's the job. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is fascinating. Tapping into their loves, their interests, right? Their their curiosity, you're saying, is at the heart of our work. Now, given given that, and I will, I will recognize that as essential, but we've got some of these requirements, and you know them. <laughs> Every teacher does, right? So outcomes yeah. and, and assessments that are soon to follow. They're going to show up in every classroom. So how does the teacher, right? How does the teacher consider those things, kind of where we're headed and what we need them to know, while at the same time maintaining the student's interest and that imaginative exploration that you just described? How do we do that? How do we keep that balance? uh, Yeah, that's so good. And and I love that there's a lot of thought in the classical movement right now around, you know, rethinking assessment um, and considering, okay, these traditional, I can't say classical, these traditional assessments that we use, um, giving them a test, having them write a paper, book reports, all this kind of stuff. What do they actually do, right? What's the point of them really? And if we're honest, um, and and, and most teachers know this because we feel it as we're grading the 30th or 40th instance of the thing, we recognize the utter futility of the project we've set them, right? Um, It's just a way of finding out if they've done the work. Well, I would say that um, first of all, I would say two things about that. One is, uh, I seem to always be saying two things about everything. The first is that if, you're, if your goal with an assessment is to find out whether the students have done the work, there are better ways to do that that are more fun for the student and more fun for you as a teacher. Sure. Right. The second thing is, if your goal with the work you're sending students is just to find out if they've done the reading or whatever else, you're missing learning opportunities, right? So mm. my first, for me personally, when I when I create my assessments, my first criterion is this is not simply evaluative this is also a teaching tool uh-huh. so they should learn something from do taking the test they should learn something from writing the paper or whatever the mm-hmm. thing happens to be mm-hmm. um and so that's a that's an important piece of it and that that changes how i grade it too right if i'm giving someone a latin test that is also meant to teach them 
I cannot, in all fairness, penalize them for getting things wrong in the same way that I would if its only purpose were to evaluate whether they had learned the thing or not. Right. So I'm going right. to think about how I construct the point structure on the exam to line up with the purposes for which I'm creating the exam, namely to help them see something that maybe I think they would, they would maybe can only see in this kind of a real world situation, or at least is best seen in this kind of a real world situation. But then beyond that, and here's a point where I want to connect this back to something we've already talked about before. We've spoken about how important imagination is for our students and how we want to make sure that we give them space to express that imagination in the classroom and that we want to make sure that we're putting material in front of them that's going to feed that imagination. But there's another place where imagination is seriously important, and that's with the teacher. Hmm. The teacher's got to be able to look beyond what's been done before to think of other ways of doing things. I want to assign things for my students to do that are going to be opportunities for them to bring not just their best understanding, but also their best creativity and imagination to that project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That may look like saying, uh, I, I taught a class uh, once, I teach a class regularly now, but the first time I taught, I taught at, at an kind of university on dragons. Um, and it was about, it's really teaching, you know, introduction to reading great books, but by means of reading great books in which there were dragons. Yeah. Um, and so in order to give them, it didn't feel right to just ask them to write a standard close reading literary paper about something for the end. Um, that was one way one could come about it. But the whole point was, you know, this is not, these aren't your standard books. We're reading things like The Hobbit or The Voyage of the Dawn Treader or whatnot. And so I gave them that option, but I said, if you want, you can do a more creative project. And you just have to, you know, check with me first so we can make sure we're on the same page about what that's going to look like. And uh, man, I got some cool projects. But one of, one of the ones that comes to mind was we had read Tolkien's uh, retelling of the Volsung saga in which he imitated the uh, alliterative meter of Norse um, poetry. Yeah. In the beginning of that book, Christopher Tolkien gives explains the nature of the meter and how it works so we can track what his father was doing and all of that. One of the students got really fired up by that, and he decided to write a poem in that epic meter about Smaug before he comes to the mountain to kill oh all the dragons. Oh, my goodness. Right? Oh, and I just, it, was, it was a delight to read. Grading sure. was way more fun. The sure. student had more fun doing it. He, he checked off every box you could hope to see. Close yep. reading, textual yep. analysis, control. Yep. I mean, it was all there, right? I think that's the kind of thinking we need to be willing to engage in as teachers in order to create spaces that students are not just going to be willing to move into, yep. they're going to yep. delight to move into, right? You got to hold them back from. from yeah, yeah. Into. Yeah, I, I, I guess if we expect them to be creative and we're trying to generate that creativity, we as teachers are also going to, to have to show and, 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 and demonstrate our commitment to being creative when it comes to these things. That's right. Well, I, I think one of the things you said earlier as you were describing uh, the, the bookish types, geeks, I think was the word you used. Uh, I definitely track with that. Uh, and, and maybe you and I probably fall into that category. Um, however, We've got students of a variety of backgrounds and temperaments and abilities and capacities to, to focus or attend to the work, right? Anytime we walk into that classroom of 25 or more, how is that going to affect the teacher's ability to promote or cultivate wonder in that classroom? Like, what are we going to do with that, that genuine diversity? Yeah, yeah, this is a big, this is a big question. And it's one that we're still, I think, coming to understand um, as 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 we get more and more diversity in our schools, um, we're going to see a greater and greater challenge because, you know, the, the teacher's job is to meet the students where they are and to bring them along this road as far as they can. Right. And, and you can't predetermine that. You don't know when you walk into the classroom at the beginning of the year how far the students are going to be able to make it. Right. And your job is not to, you know, get them through chapter 32 of the book, your job is to bring them as far along that road as makes sense for where they're starting from. Um, because the process is, is, is the process is the process and you can't short circuit that. So what happens then when all the students, when you, you come in and you've got four different starting points in terms of academic ability, in terms of academic background, in terms of economic background, in terms of cultural connection, right? In terms of parental engagement, which we know is one of the major markers of student success, parental engagement, how you handle all those different types of things. Um, now that's this is um, this is a task of um, s properly suiting what you have to bring to the various individuals to whom you have to bring it, 
And the classical name for the skill of coordinating these things mm-hmm. is wisdom. Wisdom is what a teacher needs because wisdom is that by which we take principles and figure out how to apply them across a variety of different situations. Mm-hmm. So, okay, that's all super re- abstract and theoretical. And everyone's like, oh, it's a scholar. That's what he's going to say. But like, I've got actual students. What do I do? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll make it a little more concrete, just a little bit more. Um, there are times when a teacher has to meet an individual student exactly where that individual student is, but we all know that the realities of classroom student teacher ratios and number of contact hours and whatnot do not allow that to be most of the time. That's the Mm -hmm. reality we're living under. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next step, the next layer up from that is, um, the classroom culture and the classroom space in a non-geographic sense, although it, 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 that notion encompasses the physical classroom, but it's not just that, right? It, it's the culture of the classroom as well. That space is not one thing, and it doesn't have to be a uniform thing. Mm. This is the this is the great genius of uh, the idea, which has been greatly abused. But the idea of breaking students out into smaller groups is essentially to create subspaces within the classroom space. That mm-hmm. will allow the students to do different types of things. Okay, what if we take that idea but don't apply it to literally breaking the students up into smaller groups so they can go and work and the teacher can have a moment to breathe? Um, what if instead we're creating conceptual breakouts in the classroom space, right? So there are um, you're, you're you're creating a not not just well I'll, I'll come back to this second. Okay. You're creating spaces where students of different sorts are invited. No, you're creating different sort of spaces that all students are invited into, but what it costs to enter into that space is different for each student. Mm-hmm. Here's an example. Um, we're going to read we're going to read Pride and Prejudice. Okay? So now we're going to create we're creating a classroom space in which the discussion is going to be about this book that we're all expected to read and talk about together historically speaking, it's been easier for girls to enter into that space than for boys to enter into that space, right? But you're asking everyone to enter, the, to enter into that space. And so you've got to be aware of the varying costs of the different students coming in, and you've got to prepare things, and I think best things from the text, that will help the students for whom that's a difficult transition to find their way in. Because the task isn't just for the boys to have read Pride and Prejudice, nor do we want to say to the boys, okay, guys, this is going to suck. This is this is not a good book for boys. Okay, sorry. But it's okay because I've got a good book for you coming next. And girls, enjoy this because next we're reading Treasure Island and you're done. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the ideal. The job of the teacher is if it's worth setting Pride and Prejudice before them to read, then it's worth all of them reading it. But the teacher has got to do the work of helping the boys to find themselves in it too. Yeah. Or helping yeah. the girl who isn't the typical girl who doesn't find herself in Pride and Prejudice, helping her to find herself in it too. So in one sense, with the syllabus, you're creating different spaces to bring the students in to manage that. But I think that's still just the tip of the iceberg. The real thing is within a given moment on the syllabus, within the reading of Pride and Prejudice, how do I create spaces, subspaces of Pride and Prejudice? that are easier for some of these boys to enter into than the girls to enter into. And therefore show them that Pride and Prejudice is the kind of book that they can find themselves in. that says something meaningful about the lives they're living and about the issues they're facing and about the things they care about and they love about, right? So I think that's the that's the fundamental principle that I approach things with to say, okay, so now, now with any individual class, it's a matter of judging what does it have to look like in terms of a discussion, in terms of a reading assignment, you know, what are we focusing on? A class activity that allows this to come to life more in this or that way. This is fascinating because I had never thought about it uh, necessarily as being an opportunity that the syllabus, as you put it, being an opportunity to imagine, for example, how my choleric student versus my melancholic might approach Mm -hmm. this text or see this text and certainly the male and female distinction. Uh, But I think there's a way in which something like that kind of rubric around the, the variability and the genuine mm-hmm. diversity that exists in a mm-hmm. classroom provides ample opportunity, particularly with literature, but, but this could be said perhaps of many of the philosophic and, 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 and humanistic texts to sort of see it from its many facets. Because we know that's important when we when we come to the seminar table, right? Mm-hmm. We want to get the facetedness of the text out on the table in the course of conversation. But that could actually be primed by the types of activities or spaces and subspaces, as you put it, 
that we develop intentionally to let them see themselves engage more directly with it, with a given text. Now, of course, we have academic skills that we're trying to propagate. Uh, we want that content mastery uh, at some level, right, for these students. Mm -hmm. And the deeply, the more deeply they engage, the more likely they are to really lay hold of it. But I want to know, because you've gone on the record as saying the goal of education is to offer the student a vision for how to be in the world. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to the academic activities, the content that we must seek to master in the school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me double down on that claim, right? Sure. Um, I'm not particularly interested. You know, as, as someone who has um, advanced degrees in literature, philosophy, and theology, I'm not particularly interested in creating students who can give you all the right answers about theology, who are super good at philosophical argumentation, who have read all the right books. If that's the if that in itself only that is the final goal of education, I don't find it that compelling. Mm. And I don't find it that compelling in my own life. That would not be enough to get me to crack the next book. Oh, I just I just want to have read. I've 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 started books like that. I've started books just because I want to have read them and I and I get into them and I don't enjoy them at all. And those are the few books in my life that I've ever abandoned are ones that I'm only reading because I want to have read them and they don't capture me in any other way. That's not why I read all these books. Right? That's not why they're all here. Each of these books gives me something that I need to either envision how to live in the world in the ways that I'm trying to, or to actually carry out the work of living in the world that I'm trying to do. Let me make it simpler and plainer. I'm the go it, Teaching requires wisdom. The goal of education is for the student to become a teacher, their own teacher. A lifelong learner is someone who teaches themselves. The goal of education is that same wisdom. So the skills that are required are going to be, what's, what, what makes it a skill, right? You know the old adage, if you build a, a man on fire, he'll be warm for a night. But if you set a man on fire, he'll be warm for the rest of his life. Oh wait, no, that's not right. If you <laughs> if you teach him to make a fire, <laughs> um, and so so why teach him to make a fire? Well, so he can make fires, right? And so now he can warm himself. But now that he can make fires, he can not only warm himself; he can also cook his food. He can clear his fields so that they're more fertile to grow later. He can remove structures that stand in his way. He can wage war against his fellow men. There's all these things he can do with the skill of fire that. Um, that allow him to move through the world in ways that are both virtuous and vicious. Mm -hmm. Likewise, mastering poetry, mastering Shakespeare, mastering theology, mastering Plato and Aristotle, it's not for the purpose of being, of, of standing in the room and people are talking and Plato comes up and says, everyone says, oh, well, you should talk to him because he's the master of Plato and you're sitting over there with your pipe and you're like, oh, quite. <laughs> right? That's not the point of it. The point of mastering Plato is that I live my life differently because I've wrestled with Plato. Um, I don't live my life like Plato told me to, but I live my life in ways I never would have dreamed to live them had I not had to wrestle with Plato and had I not had to ask myself, why don't I want to do it? like Plato says I should do it. Um, why don't I want to do what Aristotle says? Why isn't Aristotle right about this? Why are they wrong when they say that if a man knows the good, he will do it? Mm. I learned important things about myself, my society, and my world from wrestling with that. And so then the ways that I choose to act in my family, with among my friends, in my culture, in the political sphere, all of those ways are different because I've had to wrestle with those ideas. So that's, to, to, to me, then what we're doing is we're ordering the tasks of education, which is the acquisition of certain skills and the acquisition of a kind of content mastery. We're ordering those tasks to a higher end. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make them purely instrumental, but there is an instrumentality to it. Everything that is not ultimate has an instrumental component to it, right? We, 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 the, the enemy is not instrumentality. The instrument is mere instrumentality. It's nothing yeah. but right. this. Based on yeah. Something else. Yeah. 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 This is fascinating. I, I, I have one final question. You've already started to answer it, but I'm going to let you put 
an even finer point on it when I say, given the number of books, and you are quite prolific, the scholarship that you've been conducting over these many years and the presentations that you're out there providing, and obviously the coursework that you that you have on offer, what do you hope to accomplish? Now, I, I do want to set aside or at least demarcate a couple of audiences. I'm really interested in what you hope to see the scholarly community do with your work, in part because that informs us. It helps train the next generation of teachers, right? It equips us with some of the understanding as they go continually deeper into a subject area. That's all very well and good. And I want to know if you have specific intention there for the scholarly community with the arc of your work. But then, of course, you can imagine for this audience, much of our audience would be teachers and even parents who are interested in understanding classical education more deeply. What would you like to achieve among them? So those two, if you could just answer, and maybe it's the same answer, but uh, I really want to know kind of how your work, how you hope your work is going to affect change. Yeah. Well, speaking of the scholarly group, this circles back around to the very first question you asked me, how did I get, how did wonder and imagination become such important aspects for me of the educational enterprise? Um, doing graduate studies um, in literature, theology, and philosophy, um, you come up against a lot of assumptions. You come up against a lot of practices. And there are things that I would have these ideas, and I would say these ideas, and I thought they were really cool, and I would often be met with, no, that's not how it is. That's not how things work. Um, and I thought, well, that's, I mean, I get that, but do they have to work that way? Like, is there something, is, is there value in pursuing whether they could work this way? And and the worst people in my experience about this are philosophers and theologians, because there's a tendency among philosophers to think, no, we know the laws of logic. And these are not the laws of late 20, you know, 20, 20, late 20th and early 21st century Western thought. These are the laws of thought in all possible worlds. Every person everywhere, divine persons even, mm -hmm. would have to obey the laws of logic as we know them. <laughs> and therefore, anything that violates our laws of logic is impossible in the strongest imaginable sense. That, that was always um, implausible to me. It was always implausible to me that human beings at this particular stage in our development with all of the various baggage that comes with being human beings would have this line on the rules for all possible thinking any and everywhere for everyone. Um, surely there's something flawed in our understanding of the laws of logic. We can see that our understanding of logic has progressed. Why should we think that we've reached the end point of that with no mm. further progression is possible? Mm. Every person who has ever come to any place in thinking about thinking to that person, it always seems as if they have reached the end because that's what it means to be on the forefront of something, right? But yeah, there's yeah. usually something else that follows. Um, and theologians are, are the same way. We tend to think, well, we know how God is. Um, and so that's the way all of our thinking has to develop from this understanding of God that we have, which frankly was derived from Plato and Aristotle. Um, and that's, that's just the nature of the divine. And anything outside of that is just not really understanding the divine well. Well, what, after a, a, quite a bit of frustration with these types of conversations, what I diagnosed as the problem was a fundamental failure of imagination. So many times you'd see arguments, people would say, well, I can't imagine that, I, that it could be any different. So it has to be this way. Um, a very, very famous, a very, not famous, prestigious philosopher um, made an argument in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is the philosophy, is this major thing, um, concerning the nature of causality. And he says, well, um, we can prove, we can philosophically prove that the only types of causes there can be in the world are physical causes. And, 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 and here's how. And you look at this argument, and his argument is simply this. We have never, in all of our experience, encountered any other type of cause than a, non, than, than a physical cause. All of our attempts to come up with non-physical causes are based on analogies to physical causality. Therefore, there cannot be non-physical causality. And you don't have to be a trained philosopher to recognize that that's a bad argument. <laughs> Just because I've never come across it before means it, it's not possible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But then I began to notice, oh my gosh, this is not just philosophers and theologians. I began to see this in the political sphere. I began to see this in regular human conversation, in parenting, 
in being a friend and imagining what it's possible for a friend to do, mm-hmm. right? Um, I think a lot of people these days are watching Ted Lasso. Um, my wife and I are, are getting caught up on it. And, and we, there was this episode that came up the other day where the notion was you don't tell your friends about problems in their romantic relationships. You don't get involved in that. You stay out of that. Don't touch it. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, that's my, my diagnosis is that you need a broader understanding of friendship than that. Mm-hmm. Let me, let g- give me five minutes. Let me take you to, to the Hobbit. Let's look at Bilbo and Thorin Oakenshield. They've been through a lot together. Bilbo has earned Thorin's trust and respect through a great deal of effort. And at the end of the book, he takes the thing that is the most valuable thing in all of Thorin's experience, the Arkenstone, the, 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 the Arkenstone of his father. Yeah, yeah. Right? Bilbo himself says, this is the heart of the mountain, or rather, it's the heart of Thorin Oakenshield. Mm-hmm. So he takes this metaphorical heart of his friend and gives it to his friend's enemies in an act of ultimate betrayal. Hmm. If your notion of friendship isn't big enough to encompass that type of action, then I think you're suffering from a failure of imagination when it comes hmm. to friendship. Hmm. So what I want scholars, what I want my work to do for scholars is I want it to, to motivate for them the plausibility of dreaming bigger, to not be hmm. afraid to let their imagination go beyond what their teachers told them was possible or what all humans up to this point have been able to figure out was possible because we're facing challenges in the world today that are going to require solutions of a radical imaginative nature. And so So, because you can think be outside of those boxes in radical ways. It sounds like Einstein's uh, formulation uh, is well worth repeating, right? To get, uh, to get young scholars on fairy tales quickly. But what about the teachers, right? And what about our parents? What do you hope your work can accomplish with them? An analogous thing. Um, Because at the end of the day, everything's pointed at the children because the children are the ones who are gonna solve the the problems that we're creating now, right? So Uh (laughs) if we get the children right, (laughs) then all of the parents, the teachers, and the scholars of the next generation are all going to be right because they were all raised up right from being children. So, so then what I want parents and teachers to get are the things they're going to need to raise those children correctly. Not just for the children, though. I think it's also going to make their lives better. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot more joy in teaching when you can bring a radical creativity to it. When I hear teachers talking about the work that they do, um, the teachers who have come up with some really cool, pro- right? You're, you're always in a conversation with a teacher like, you know, so what do you do? Oh, I teach Latin. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. And at some point they're like, you know what? I did this one project with my students one time and everything about them changes. They light up and, and there's a lot of animation. <laughs> eyes are, you know, and they tell you about this, this project they did, which was not something you would have found in a manual for how to teach Latin. And you can tell that that's their favorite thing they've ever done with students. Yeah. And they look forward to doing that every year. That experience can be more common. I want parents and teachers to enter into the joy of imagination and wonder so that out of that space of delight, they can more easily invite other students into that space of delight as well. That's why I don't just teach courses for children on dragons. I teach courses for adults on dragons Mm -hmm. because if you can come in and study with me and get your heart set on fire and have your mind blown at the same time, right? A, bl- a, a blown mind and a burning heart. That's my goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Rigor and wonder. If I can get both of those things going in you, I know that when you go back into your classroom, whether that's a homeschool classroom or a brick and mortar classroom or whatever it happens to be, I know that when you go back into those spaces, you're going to bring a creativity and an energy and a fire that the kids are going to see. And that's the other major marker, the other major indicator of academic success. We've mentioned one, parental engagement. Mm -hmm. The other one is passion in the teacher. Mm -hmm. Study Mm -hmm. after study, anecdote after anecdote shows that when students see their teachers on fire about what they're teaching, they catch fire too. So very true. So very well said. I am uh, reminded, I think it was Tolkien, maybe it was McDonald, but certainly in that strain that fairy stories are for everyone from eight to 88. Uh, This is the heart of the matter because we are bringing together mind and heart 
in the combination that you've just described. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for your time, for just exploring these ideas with us. I think we find ourselves on the receiving end of much wisdom that you have shared today. And I look forward to uh, posting in the show notes several items, including your own website, where folks can go and learn more about the work you're doing at Junius Johnson Academics. Thanks so much for your time. 